my junior year of high school, I thought it would be cool to take a psychology class because it sounded interesting to me. It's also because the psychology teacher had a reputation as being awesome, and as I'm sure you all agree, having a teacher that was chill and made stuff interesting made school go way faster. But then when all the classes and stuff were posted online, I found out I wasn't getting taught by the cool psych teacher. I was in a class with a fresh hire. Basically, so many people applied to the psych class that the school denied to hire a second teacher. And so a whole bunch of the kids who partially or only chose in psych because they thought that it was going to be an easy ride were super angry that they were with this new teacher whose reputation they were unfamiliar with. And I was a little disappointed, but I was actually in it for the subject too, not just an easy pass. But then once we actually met this dude, we realized that he was the total opposite of the cool psych teacher in almost every way. At first, we just thought he was a little harsh, but anyone would have seemed like a buzzkill in comparison to the other psych teacher. But then as time went on, he started to get a little weird. I didn't hate the guy, not at first, but like I said, things got so bad that I even started to think that he was an a-hole. He'd snap on people for being late or talking in class, but then that's standard for some teachers. But then he started doing it to people over nothing at all. He once berated a kid for getting an answer wrong and acted like he was trying to be funny by giving him a joke answer. But I was there and the kid wasn't joking around. It was the wrong answer, but that's all it was. The kid was just trying to learn and our psych teacher basically went in for some verbal ground and pound and it was brutal. Everyone thought that he was a jerk after that and I heard one or two kids actually complained about him. But then, like, instead of the a-hole style of teaching becoming his standard, things just got worse and worse. Until eventually, he completely snapped on this one kid who had to switch classes because of scheduling issues. The guy must have heard how much of a jerk our psych teacher was, but he obviously didn't understand just how bad he'd actually gotten because the teacher was in the middle of talking when this kid turned to his neighbor and started trying to talk to them. I remember the kid's neighbor just completely ignoring him, knowing better than to become our teacher's target, but that only made the original kid be like, why are you ignoring me, a little louder than he'd been talking before. Our teacher had been writing something on the whiteboard and talking while he was doing it, but when he heard the kid saying the thing about being ignored, he just stopped. He didn't turn around right away though, he just stopped, his hand came down from the whiteboard and he just stood there like seething for a second before he turned around and asked who talked. No one said a word, not just because they didn't want to snitch on the guy, but because they just didn't want to become this guy's target. Seems crazy to look back on now, how he was still even in a classroom I mean, but there he was, with all of us freaking terrified of him just hoping that he wouldn't target us individually. So as I said, he turns around and asks who talked, and we stay totally silent. But this kid just raises his hand, albeit kind of nervously to say something like I was just asking him for... And he didn't get to finish his sentence. The teacher didn't say anything. He didn't scream or yell. He just reeled back, then sent the whiteboard duster thing flying at this kid's head. Ever seen that old school footage of George Bush dodging that Iraqi guy's shoe? It was almost exactly like that. The kids saw the teacher winding up to make the pitch so he had enough time to react and dodge the throw, but the duster smacks into the desk of another kid behind him so hard that girl screamed. In that Bush video, it's kind of funny because after the shoe gets hurled at him, he actually smiles out of surprise, or maybe he was impressed because it was actually a pretty good throw. But either way... He gets rushed away by Secret Service and there's no follow-up and aside from the Iraqi dude getting roughed up on the way out, no one got hurt. But in the case of the kid who got the duster hurled at him, he was tucked away into his desk and barely had time to edge out of it before our teacher basically threw himself at the kid and just started beating on him. The kid was totally helpless. He was on the ground, but throwing kicks and trying to get away as all the kids around them jumped from their desks. Some just kind of froze at the edges of the room. Others ran off to get someone, really anyone, to come break it up. 
Some of us in class, myself included, tried various methods of breaking up the violence. Some yelled, but others actually approached our teacher, telling him to stop. But whoever did got a fist thrown in their direction, or a desk shoved towards them in one case, and one by one, everyone who approached ended up just backing off. This one guy actually put hands on the teacher who gave the kid who got attacked first a chance to get up. But by that time, he was so mad and surging with adrenaline that he tried to knock the teacher on his butt. This was not a good idea because I don't know what the hell this guy did before he was a psych teacher, but he could legitimately handle himself in a street fight. I mean, I know he was fighting high schoolers, but get this. The kid he'd been wailing on first, jacked up with adrenaline, must have totally abandoned the whole flight thing in favor of fight. But then as he steps towards our teacher, he spins around, just kind of eats the kid's first punch, and then responds by lunging forward and grabbing him by the throat. Everything up to that point had been just startling and crazy, but not terrifying or horrifying or anything really and truly deep like that. But then, as our teacher got a hold of this kid's neck and squeezed as hard as he could, there was just this immediate change of vibe in the room. It went from like, well, we're probably going to talk about this for a long time to, holy crap, someone's about to get murdered right here in front of the class. And I mean it too. If it wasn't for the school security guards showing up when they did, I actually think our teacher might have killed him. Anyways, as you can probably guess, the aftermath of the whole thing was insane. A bunch of people got suspended, the teacher included, and after a lengthy court case, he ended up going to jail for quite some time. The kid, whose butt he beat, ended up testifying against him in court, and it was probably the most insane time I've ever had in school. Back in junior high, I remember we had a Gulf War vet for a science teacher, who for the sake of anonymity I'll just call Mr. Marine. Mr. Marine was the kind of dude who obviously had his crap together in times of panic. In the three years we were there, I almost never saw him do more than crack a calm smile. Then in ninth grade, junior high was 7th, 8th, and ninth where I went, this girl, Chloe, who showed up late to our first period class every day and was kind of quiet, she failed to show up at all. For some reason, instead of marking her absent, he called the office and had a very quiet conversation. He looked visibly disturbed and shaken. The next day, the girl showed up to class just a bit late, but with a broken nose, a black eye, and her jaw wired shut. Even though this was 25 or so years ago, I can still see the look on Mr. Marine's face when he saw her. It was pure, murderous fury, and even more terrifying, he pulled her into his office, had a calm conversation with her, and sent her to the nurse. He then told the rest of us that nobody was to say anything to her about it as she'd had an accident and was embarrassed, and most people didn't even really care. Quickly the rumors spread though, did you see Chloe? Jesus, somebody kicked the hell out of her. I happened to be passing the office on my way home that night, and I saw the principal and two police officers, Mr. Marine and Chloe, in there with the door shut, and she was crying. One of the police officers noticed me looking and pulled the blinds. I normally walked home, so I waited. I think school got out at around 2.30 or so, and I usually hung around with some friends to listen to music or play basketball for 30 minutes or whatever before I started walking. I waited outside the front of the school until almost 4 p.m. Finally, a car pulled up, and this dude gets out, looking just angry. He's swearing to himself, and as I'm the only one out there, he says, You, where's the office? And I just pointed, but he didn't make it to the door. The two cops came out quick, one in front and one behind, and the one who approached the guy started telling him to calm down. This angry dude just loses his mind, screaming, My daughter should have been home an hour ago and I had to leave work, I'm going to sue. The cops are trying to calm him down. Then out of nowhere, Mr. Marine comes out of the side door of the office, his face lit like the fires of hell, and he just straight up goes full horizontal, 
four feet in the air and just body tackles this guy. In seconds, he's on top of him and he's probably hit the guy ten times, close fists and all. And worse yet, he's not saying a single thing. He's not making any noise, just deep rhythmic breathing like you do when weightlifting. Short breath in, long breath out, smack, smack, smack. The cops actually kind of take their time getting him off the guy. One casually handcuffs the guy and the other handcuffs Mr. Marine who is standing untouched except for some bloody knuckles and breathing steadily. Face red from exertion, eyes wide in anger and satisfaction, he's just not saying a word. I decide to walk home at that point. And as I'm heading up the road, an ambulance, sirens and all, flies past me towards the school. And the next day, Mr. Marine wasn't in school and we had a substitute instead. By the end of the day, people were telling me the story, and it was completely wrong, of course. I heard things like, Mr. Marine pulled out a gun and shot him in the gut, or Mr. Marine stabbed him with that flip knife he has, or even Mr. Marine choked him out and almost killed him and now he's in prison. None of those were true, obviously. And then the next week, without any explanation at all, Mr. Marine was back, First thing I noticed was written on the chalkboard, if you ask, you go to detention. His face made it clear that he wasn't to be tested and did not have any sense of humor about it. Nobody saw Chloe again after that. I don't know what happened. And about five or six years ago, I was telling this story to a friend and he said, well, why don't you just look her up on Facebook? I felt stupid that I hadn't even thought of that. I went to my mom's, broke out my junior high yearbook and found her last name that I'd completely forgotten, and I typed it into Facebook, and I found a couple dozen options, and her name is pretty common, and eventually I found her on LinkedIn, of all places. She ended up going to the University of Colorado, a master's program, and now works in finance or something. Her photo looked happy, which made me happy too. I googled her a bit out of curiosity and found some articles that she'd written for various anti-bullying and abuse awareness and management things. One of them was told like a fictional story almost. A girl came to school late every day, lacking in energy, and she had no personality of note and was quiet and meek. She wore loose-fitting clothing and she had a few friends. It was evident to me pretty quickly what she was talking about, which was herself. And in the story, she writes, the girl had been physically abused for years by her stepdad, an abusive alcoholic, and it took a teacher with no training at all to determine what had happened and start the chain of events that ended the abuse. The point of the story was to teach other teachers what signs to watch out for, what personality traits to look for. And after that, I looked up Mr. Marine as well to see how he was doing. I was worried he was dead. After all, he was in his 50s and 60s back then. I found a few articles about his coaching. He had also been the baseball coach of the high school, and a note saying that he'd retired in 2001. Nothing after that, and no obituary or anything. I like to think that he's probably just sitting around watching reruns of some show that he likes, drinking beer and playing with his grandkids, who are probably about the age Chloe and I were at the time. And that's just what I like to imagine. Anyways. The scariest night of my life was November 22nd of 2008. It was a Sunday and my sister and I were getting ready for bed when we heard someone shouting from outside in our driveway. They were shouting out our family name, something which I'm not going to share and as much as it scared me, I didn't understand the significance of it at the time. I thought some very angry person was shouting at all of us when, really, he was shouting for my dad. It was my sister who first peeked through the blinds to see what all the commotion was and it was her who first started panicking saying, Mommy, Mommy, he's got a gun. Mom took us into her and our dad's room, which was at the back of the house, and that's where we stayed until our dad returned and said that we were safe to come out. Our mom kept telling us, Daddy's going to keep us safe, don't worry, everything's going to be just fine. But my sister and I were a pair of emotional wrecks at that point. I was personally convinced that this crazy idiot in our driveway was going to shoot my dad, so I was inconsolable until he finally showed up again. 
I can't remember him telling us anything other than, it's okay, the angry man is gone. And as much as I was still shaky from the shock of the whole thing, I took their word that everything was going to be okay. My sister and I took a while to calm down, but when we did, mom and dad put us to bed, tucked us in, and once again reassured us that everything was going to be just fine. But everything was not going to be fine. I remember how, in the weeks that followed, I noticed how mom and dad seemed to be fighting an awful lot. Then, as the months went by, I noticed that dad seemed to be sleeping on the couch in his office sometimes, and was staying extra late at work instead of coming home for dinner around six every evening. This continued for a while until one day mom and dad sat me and my sister down and explained that dad wasn't going to be living with us anymore. He was moving out of state for his job and some place we wouldn't be able to visit. They told us that they still loved each other very much and that it was only going to be a temporary thing, but we still didn't take it very well. We asked if we could go with him or if he could get a job someplace else so he wouldn't have to move, but none of that was possible, they said. He was leaving, at least for a while, and we just had to get used to it. I can't remember how long it was after that, but then came the day that mom sat us down all over again with no dad this time and told us that they were getting a divorce. She gave us some excuse at the time, but we didn't find out the real reason until many, many years later. And although I don't know 100% exactly how this happened, I imagine it went something like this. So there once was a little girl in our town whose dad bought her a cell phone for her 13th birthday. The little girl was attached to the phone as you can imagine and was never shy about said attachment. But then one day, her dad notices that she's being a little too secretive with the device and as time goes by, his suspicion grows and he asks her who she's texting all the time. She tells him something like, just friends daddy, and when he asks, can I see, she gets super defensive and starts talking about privacy and boundaries and all this other stuff a 13 year old shouldn't be talking about. The guy confiscates his daughter's phone, takes a look through the text messages, and then finds a chain of extremely inappropriate texts with someone she's listed in her contacts under the nickname Boyfriend. The father demands to know who his daughter is talking to, because obviously kids shouldn't be saying such explicit things to each other, but the daughter seems intent on keeping that person's name a secret. The father threatens grounding, zero TV privileges, but still, his daughter won't say who her dirty pen pal is. And that's when the father decides to just call the number. But then when the person on the other end picks up the call, he doesn't hear the pubescent voice of some junior high schooler. No. Instead, the father hears the voice of a grown man saying something like, Oh hey baby, I thought you'd never call back. Now I don't imagine the father was pleased about learning that an adult was listed in his middle school daughter's phone as boyfriend. That's the understatement of the century. But I also don't imagine the guy was too forthcoming with his name or home address once he realized who was actually calling him. Yet somehow, the dad still extracted the man's identity from his daughter, and in the end, her secret dirty pen pal turned out to be none other than my own father. He was her middle school teacher, and although I don't care to imagine how he went about it, he somehow got a hold of this girl's cell phone number and was in the process of grooming her when her father found out about it. My dad didn't go to work someplace. He went to jail. And to protect us from the truth, mom went along with this version of the truth until we were old enough to find out for ourselves. She didn't deny it when we confronted her with what we'd found, and honestly, that whole discovery process could make a pretty good story all on its own. But we came to understand why she'd chosen never to bring it up. We were always going to find out someday, but I guess it was just a matter of time. Better to let someone else break our hearts than do it herself. This is the single craziest thing I ever saw when I was in school, and come to think of it, I've never seen anything that crazy since, so I guess this tops the list for my whole life. I live and work in Texas, but I grew up in Taiwan, 
with the joke being that I'm less howdy y'all and more ni howdy y'all, which is a super funny Mandarin language joke that only the galaxy brings among your listeners will appreciate. That, or maybe I'm just terrible at writing jokes in my second language, and I'm sure they'll let me know in the comments. Anyway, I grew up in Taiwan, and since my high school campus was pretty small, a few of the buildings were three or four stories to accommodate all the students. One day we're sitting in class in total silence, busy with some physics exercise books. Our teacher was sat at his desk in front of us, and then suddenly, he pushed back his chair in a way that made it squeak against the floor, and it drew many of our attentions, but what kept them is that our teacher started to suddenly take his shoes off. It had to be a rational explanation, right? Itchy foot, stone in his shoe, there are a lot of reasons why he might suddenly take his shoes off. But then right after putting his untied dress shoes right up there on the desk, he started taking his socks off too. By then, myself and my fellow students were all watching him and looking at each other as if to say, what in the world has gotten into him? Because having a teacher behave like this was nothing we'd ever seen before. Our teacher did the same thing with his socks as he did with his shoes, tucking them into the shoes on the desk in front of him. And then, with everyone watching, our teacher walked over to one of the windows, opened it up, and then threw himself out of it. If you've ever heard of that bystander effect, this was a classic example of it. No one did a thing until our teacher was falling three stories down. It was like we were frozen until it was too late to do anything about it, but then the moment he started to fall, it was like we all came out from under the effects of a magic spell. There were shouts, screams, and we all ran over towards the windows to look. I remember him lying there, not moving and thinking, oh my god, he's dead. Some of our class ran to get help, but most of us stayed where we were, looking down at our teacher's seemingly lifeless body in complete shock. Shortly afterward, the school's staff went in full crisis mode, calling in medics and ushering children away from the area where our teacher was lying. It was, and is, a very traumatic memory, but there is a kind of happy ending to all this. Our teacher survived the fall. He was in a very bad condition, but he did survive. About a week later, we were told that our teacher had been sick and that he needed some time off to recover. I now understand that what he suffered from was essentially a complete nervous breakdown. And although none of us knew what caused this outside of rumors, some said his wife had left him, others said one of his sons had taken his own life and he blamed himself. But none of those were ever confirmed and to me, the reasons aren't really important. I heard he carried on teaching, but didn't return to our school, and although he terrified all of us that day, I'm very glad he survived, and I hope he finally found some peace. I used to go to Sunday school when I was in Nehi. I grew up in a very low-income area of coastal Louisiana, back when everything was still a mess from Katrina. So instead of classes being held in church or any other kind of building for that matter, they were held in a revival tent that had emptied out following morning service. For the longest time, there were two teachers, one man and one woman, and I remember them being your typical church people. Nice, but just kind of boring, you know. Anyway, this one week they introduced a third teacher. He didn't actively participate, though. He was more like a teacher's assistant or something. He was so quiet he was almost mute, too. I think I heard him say three words in total, and I was maybe there ten or eleven times when he was there being that third teacher. I remember my buddy's mom saying how weird he was to his dad. They didn't think I was listening, but I was. His mom said the guy creeped her out, and she didn't feel comfortable with him being around us kids. I guess other parents were feeling the same way, and I guess some of them did some digging on the guy, too, because one week, the cops showed up after some kid's dad tried to knock his teeth out. I remember the guy walking through the tent, the angry dad, I mean, before he threw himself at the quiet third teacher. The main male teacher was a big guy, and it's a good thing, too, because if he wasn't, Old quiet teacher there would have been spread over that tent like peanut butter and jelly. And as soon as it happened, 
The lady teachers started herding us away from the violence, so I remember at first hearing nothing but screaming and crying from the other kids there, who were obviously terrified by what was going on. But I do remember hearing the dad screaming this one exact thing as the teacher was dragging him off. He was screaming something like, We know what you are, boy. We know what you are. Next Sunday, my mom and dad said that we weren't going to that Sunday school anymore, and my buddy's parents told him the same thing. They said it was gone, moved on or something, and they'd have to find us someplace else to go for Sunday school. And to be honest, I didn't really dig going to Sunday school anyways, and I only didn't complain so much because my dad used to go too, and he lived way out on the other side of the county, so there was no seeing him outside of school otherwise. Not going to Sunday school meant not getting to hang out with him, but it also meant getting to actually go home after church instead of having to hang out in some stinky canvas tent with a bunch of boring old church folk and a mute weirdo. And a long time after, I'm hanging out with the buddy I used to go to Sunday school with. We were in high school by that time, so twice the age we were when that Sunday school thing happened, and I barely remembered it until we randomly brought it up that day. I thought it was kind of funny at first. Like I was laughing because it was such a random wild memory, a fist fight at a Sunday school in front of all of us kids. And I'm like, oh, you remember that? Expecting him to laugh too, but he doesn't. He just looks at me awkwardly because it wasn't a setup and there was no punchline. The weird quiet guy might have seemed harmless, but he wasn't. Or actually he might have been, but not enough. I guess that doesn't make a lick of sense, let me explain. A few years before he got the job at the Sunday school, our quiet weirdo got caught waggling his wang in front of an elementary school. He ended up going to jail, but got out early after volunteering for, and brace yourselves before y'all hear this, chemical castration. Now I'm not an attorney, so I'm not going to pretend to know how something like that happens, but apparently the proof of this chemical castration stuff all of his paperwork, I mean, was the only reason he got hired at the Sunday school. The male and female teaching duo thought that that was a sign of his true repentance, like the whole thing was his cross to bear or something and gave him a chance to do good around children and not hurt them. I guess I can kind of attest to the fact that he didn't make a move on any of us kids, at none that I saw. I don't think he ever got a moment alone with us. But that was probably down to the fact that the Sunday school knew about this guy's past and even with all those pills he was taking to take his libido away, they didn't really trust him around kids. It doesn't excuse them hiring the guy though. I respect all that forgive and forget Christian stuff, but I just don't feel like that extends to anyone caught trying to diddle children. I don't know if they approached him or if he approached them and honestly, I don't know what's worse but I feel like it was only a matter of time before the guy went back to his old habits, and it's kind of scary to think that it could have been me that he tried it on. My name is Steve, and I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and although this didn't happen to me or any teacher I ever had, I think it's an incredible story and I'd like to share it with you and your subscribers. I tend to think about it whenever I'm stressed or whenever a coworker jokes or sometimes doesn't joke about being on the verge of going insane. Because no matter how bad things get for us, they could always be worse and I feel the coming story is the best possible illustration of that. So way back in March of 1900, a 40 year old Indianapolis school teacher named Carrie Selvage had a complete mental breakdown and was admitted to the Indianapolis Union State Hospital. There's no specific reason given as to why Carrie was admitted. All her records say things like stress or melancholy. But admitted she was, and she was given her very own room on the first floor of the building, which apparently had a pretty nice view of the grounds. Then one morning, not long after Carrie was admitted, one of the hospital's nurses entered her room to find her standing next to a window. She asked Carrie if everything was okay, only for Carrie to then ask for a glass of milk. The nurse goes to get her one, making sure to lock the door behind her, but when she comes back, Carrie was gone. 
The walk down to the kitchens took less than five minutes, there and back, and Carrie was wearing a thin gown and slippers at the time, so it was only logical that she couldn't have gotten far. The hospital staff then went about looking for her, covering the entirety of the hospital's grounds in the process, but found no trace of her anywhere. This sparked off a big panic among the staff at the time, not just because Carrie was missing, but because her brother was due to pay her a visit that very same day. They looked all over the place again, but couldn't find Carrie, and when her brother showed up, they were forced to tell him the truth. And needless to say, he was pissed. Carrie's family were informed, who in turn enlisted the help of law enforcement and dozens of volunteers to help find her. They spent days searching for her, going over the hospital's grounds again, then expanding their search to nearby fields and forests. They walked rivers, dragged creeks and lakes, all on the off chance that she'd fallen in and drowned. But again, no trace of her was ever found. In the end, the cops were basically forced to abandon the search and left only one detective on the case. That meant if Carrie's friends and family wanted to carry on looking for her, they'd have to do it themselves. Years go by, and even with the offer of a sizable reward, no one comes forward with any useful information. There were rumors that she'd been spotted boarding a train to Ohio, which I'm pretty sure was her home state, but none of those rumors could be substantiated, so the search continued. Cut to two years later, in 1902, and at some medical school, a doctor is performing a corpse dissection in front of a group of medical students. He pulls out the human body, then pulls back the sheet revealing the subject's face, when one of the students remarks how she looked an awful lot like a missing person from over in Indiana. A bunch of other students agree that yes, it does look like that missing school teacher who went missing from the Union State Hospital. The lecture was stopped, a dentist was summoned, and after checking out the corpse's teeth, they were shocked to discover that it was, indeed, the missing Carrie Selvage. Obviously, the cops were very interested to learn how the medical school had gotten their hands on the corpse of a missing mental patient, and when asked, the school told them that they bought the body from a guy called Rufus Cantrell. This Rufus dude was then arrested, and once in custody, he confessed to being one of the most active professional grave robbers in American history. I figured it was probably in exchange or immunity or like a lesser sentence or something, but the story goes that Rufus told them everything. He gave up people he worked with, snitched on the surgeons who bought the bodies, and even told the cops exactly how he went about making money from selling bodies, either whole or in bits and pieces. I'm sure the cops wrote down everything he said, but when push came to shove, they were only interested in one thing. Just how in the hell did he get his hands on the corpse of Carrie Selvage? Supposedly, on the same night Carrie went missing, March 11th of 1900, Rufus and his grave robber buddies were hanging out in the cemetery near the Union Hospital when they spotted a woman wearing a gown and slippers. They tried to hide, but the woman saw them. Then fearing that she'd go straight to the cops, they kidnapped her, then took her to the basement of a nearby farmhouse. I think they figured that it would be a pretty simple process of convincing her that she hadn't seen anything and then letting her go, because Rufus said that they didn't try to hurt or kill her, and even tried to feed her when she was getting hungry. But as you remember, Carrie was not a well woman. She refused all offers of food and water, maybe figuring it was poisoned or something, then after two to three days of slowly starving, she passed. And that's how Rufus and his buddies ended up with a fresh corpse on their hands for a change instead of one that's already decomposing. Rufus claimed he was innocent, and that his buddies were to blame for Carrie's death, but he still got 10 years in prison for his part in it. And this was a time when print media had really taken off too, so within just a few days of Rufus's trial, the whole of the Midwest was up in arms about it, saying he hadn't gotten long enough in prison, that he should hang for what he did, stuff like that. Officials responded by establishing the State Anatomical Board, which put some of the first laws into effect requiring medical schools to obtain a cadaver legally, as well as more severe punishments for grave robbers. Carrie was eventually laid to rest in a graveyard of her family's choosing, and the hospital she vanished from was closed down. 
For a short time, it was turned into a boarding house, but that too soon closed its doors and the place remained vacant for many years. The end. Or not the end, as I came to learn while going down the research rabbit hole. What I just told you is almost like the official version. The authorities were content to make out like Carrie had been the victim of some evil grave-robbing ghoul who they so valiantly apprehended before throwing him in prison. But then, Rufus had never really claimed he was entirely innocent. He basically admitted to starving a woman to death, but he made repeated claims that it couldn't have been Carrie because it looked nothing like her at the time that she was alive. It seems the jury didn't believe him, which is why they gave him that guilty verdict, and I don't think the judge did either. But you know who did believe Rufus Cantrell? When he said that he knew for a fact the woman wasn't Carrie, Carrie's own brother, Joseph. Joseph was close with Carrie. If you remember, he was the one scheduled to visit her the same day that she went missing, and it was him that was summoned to ID her body once she was supposedly found on that medical table. There are records of him agreeing that the corpse's teeth had dental work that was similar to Carrie's, but there are also records of him saying that he wasn't entirely sure that the body was really her. I don't know how he didn't make more of an issue about this at the time because the body getting dissected couldn't have been all that badly decomposed. Maybe he did, and the authorities just ignored him. But either way, I know for a fact that he was never 100% sure that it was Carrie, and that leads me into my next point. Twenty years after the Union State Hospital shuts down, some big engineering company comes along, which decides that they're going to turn the place into a machine shop. A construction crew shows up, then starts removing whole sections of the building's inner structure, which included a section of this big old compartmented attic. From what I read, some iron worker was told to remove a small cubbyhole above the attic, something they called a cupola, which from the outside of a building appear to be nothing more than an ornamental piece in the shape of a dome or box on a building. The space was too small for the iron worker to fit through, so he decided to enlarge the entrance, but after doing so, he peered inside to find himself face to face with the human skeleton, wearing a blue nightgown and slippers. Police were immediately informed of the morbid finding, and then I guess after putting two and two together, the cops contacted Carrie's family with some very shocking news. When the skeleton was taken off to be examined, the coroner said that he couldn't determine a cause of death, but said it was very possible that it belonged to the missing Carrie, and that she'd fallen victim to cold or thirst after getting lost and trapped in the attic. I don't think Joseph quite believed this either because he didn't seem to change his tune regarding the possibility of his sister being murdered. I think he was well and truly convinced that someone at the hospital killed her, stashed her body in the attic. He said Carrie was suffering from arthritis at the time she disappeared, meaning there's no way she could have climbed all the way up into the attic on her own. I don't know how true the arthritis thing is, but I do know that murder or not, the body's discovery makes for one hell of a creepy twist in the tale. The second body, which I think was more assumed to be Carrie's than the first, was laid to rest in the grave dug for the first. The first body found was then taken off and declared a Jane Doe, as they called them. And the whole body switching thing is just awful too. Like imagine never knowing which corpse was your dead sister. The one in the grave that's been dug for her? the one that's off on some cooling board somewhere, with no name or identity at all. In September of 1958, 70-year-old Leona Dieseldorf was living at 1000 South Brady Street in Attica, Indiana. The former teacher, who'd retired almost 25 years earlier, was mostly reliant on her social security checks to put food on the table, and would often wait on her porch to meet the mailman who delivered them. But one day, the mailman arrived to discover that Leona wasn't waiting for him, and he immediately became concerned. When the man inspected Leona's mailbox and discovered that the previous day's letters hadn't been opened either, he knocked on her door and called out her name. When he got no response, he informed her neighbors of the situation and asked them to call the police. 
Then, when the police arrived, they forced their way into the property and began searching for Leona. Upon gaining entry to the property, the officers observed a mess of upturned furniture and animal feces. Leona's collection of cats had made quite a mess of her kitchen in an attempt to find food, a detail which the officers misread with grim foreboding. They assumed that, since her beloved kitties were being neglected, that Leona's corpse would be awaiting them in an upstairs bedroom. But when they climbed the stairs and inspected the second floor of the home, they discovered no sign of Leona anywhere. There was no sign of any struggle, and the only things that were missing were Leona's purse and a small lapel watch that she was known to wear. This led police to believe that she departed the home voluntarily, but her continued absence was the true cause for concern. Despite her advanced age, Leona was a very fit and active lady and was known to head off on long walks that covered up to eight miles at a time. However, on occasion, Leona was also known to hitchhike, accepting rides from locals and strangers alike. Police conceived of two possibilities, that Leona had gotten hurt on one of her fitness walks or had gotten into the car of someone with concealed but sinister intentions. Along with local volunteers, law enforcement search and rescue teams scoured her regular routes including a rural farming property that Leona owned near Stone Bluff. Leona's sister, who had passed away a few years prior, had left Leona the 80-acre piece of farming property, and Leona would sometimes visit the property whenever she wanted to feel closer to the departed. But despite an extensive search of the property, police found no sign of the missing Leona. Just less than two months following Leona's initial disappearance, two rabbit hunters from Covington, Indiana, stopped to take a break atop an old well covered in wooden planks when they noticed a foul smell coming from within. Despite its lack of use, the well still stands today and lies 11 miles southwest of Attica, Indiana, on the property of a woman named Mary Hickman. But back in 58, the property was farmed and cared by by her brother-in-law, Guy Grady. Moments after the two rabbit hunters arrived at the well, Guy and his son, Jean, who had been farming the property all day, arrived at the well to get water for the radiator in his tractor. When they too noticed the pungent odor, Guy helped Bill and Don remove the wooden planks covering the well, and after peering 40 feet down into the dark below, the men noticed the water appear to be oily and a strange bluish color floating on the water's surface. They assumed that an animal must have gotten in somehow and was decomposing in the water below. In an attempt to retrieve the dead animal, the men lowered a length of barbed wire down into the dark well. However, when they pulled the wire up, it was covered in hair that was eerily human in appearance. Then, following a second glance down the well, the men saw what appeared to be a human corpse in the ten feet of water and immediately summoned the sheriff. In the hours that followed, the badly decomposed body of Liana Dieseldorf would be dragged from the well's cold, murky waters and driven down to the county coroner's office. She was first identified by her cousin, who recognized a pair of shoes that had been pulled from the well. This cousin claimed that she was 99% sure that the shoes belonged to Leona, but it was her dental records that confirmed the tragic find. During his examination, the coroner observed that Leona's feet and wrists were bound with white plastic clothesline and that her arms were tied around her neck. Leona was found fully clothed, except for a red sweater that she was said to wear on an almost daily basis. Her purse and watch were also missing, and could well have been taken as trophies by her mysterious killer. Electrical wiring was found wrapped around her waist, with someone having carefully attached bricks from the local Attica brickyard to it to weigh her body down. A white towel was found tied around Leona's throat in two square knots, while a cloth rag was found jammed into her mouth. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, the coroner could not determine an accurate cause of death. However, it's believed that Leona was still alive when she was tossed down that well. When the police first attempted to retrieve her body, they discovered her hand was still clenched around a small pipe inside, meaning that, in all likelihood, she was conscious or had regained consciousness by the time she hit the water. 
Leona was reportedly last seen on the day before her disappearance by a former student, who saw Leona getting into the back seat of a car near Highway 41. The student's recollection of the vehicle was unclear, but they appeared quite certain Leona had been wearing her signature red sweater, as it was the detail which drew their attention in the first place. Police believe that robbery may have been the motive for Leona's murder since her purse and watch were never found. During the investigation, they heard rumors that Leona may have hidden a large sum of money at the small farm property her sister had left her, and theorized that the money was her killer's intended target. However, after an extensive search of the farm, no such stash of money was ever found. Another theory involves Leona's ex-husband, a man named Edgar Emmons. During their marriage, Edgar had had Leona involuntarily admitted to a state mental hospital under claims she was incapable of managing her financial affairs. Leona countered by claiming Edgar was abusive and the two divorced in 1931. Almost a decade later in 1943, Edgar helped a woman kidnap her own daughter whom she had lost custody of during the divorce proceedings similar to his own. He shot a policeman in the process and was jailed for attempted murder and died a few years later while still incarcerated. This obviously meant that Edgar could not have been his ex-wife's killer, but is it possible that his former companion was involved? After all, Edgar had shown such devotion to her that he'd almost killed a police officer and he no doubt talked of his divorce from Leona during his time with his new female companion perhaps as a way of granting her lover a sick form of retribution from beyond the grave, Edgar's bell tracked down his ex-wife and murdered her. The fact remains that the truth behind Leona Dieseldorf's murder remains a terrifying mystery, but behind it lurks some deeply sinister implications. And in all probability, the monster that took her life is still free to walk among us. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams on Sundays and Wednesday nights. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, or send it over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, the spiders are coordinating an attack. <laughs>